In this video, I talk with Maya Havisto. I met Maya on Twitter and saw that we had a lot of interests in common with loving kindness practice as well as internal family systems and a few other things. So I wanted to talk to her today about those topics of our shared interests. We start with talking about meditation and loving kindness practice and insight meditation and then dive a bit into jhana practice or concentration or absorption states. And then towards the end of the conversation, we talk about internal family systems and a few different self-therapy techniques that she's tried out and what her experience with those things has been and how they relate to meditation. Really enjoyed talking with Maya and hope you will as well. And as always, if you have any feedback for me, I would love to hear that. So enjoy. Okay, thanks for joining me here today, Maya. Thank you. Um, so I mentioned to you, this to you before, but there's really a lot of interests that we have in common that I'm hoping to talk about. And, um, you know, your history with meditation practice, and we have a lot of interests, I think, in similar with metta and loving kindness practice and jhana practice, and then also um, internal family systems. I've been really enjoying diving into that my, to myself and uh, talking about that with you. So wanted to have you on to talk to you about all of those things and uh, really excited that we can talk together today. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how you got interested in meditation practice and kind of a little bit about your story and your journey with meditation? Yeah, I started meditating in 2017. So I'm not really like a super long time practitioner. I had I had read about loving kindness meditation before, and I thought that might be something for me, but I just never got around to actually practicing it. But in the autumn of 2017, I decided that I'm going to start meditating. And I, uh, I went to Google, of course, and I looked up some guided loving kindness meditations and it immediately felt like this is my thing. Like literally the first time I tried it, I was like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And of course, I think a lot of people, when they start meditation, they're okay, this, is, this feels really good. So I'm going to make this a habit. And then they quickly stop doing it. For me, for me, it's not it's never really been hard to form a habit. If, if I want to do something, I'm, I'm, I just do it. So since I first tried meditation, I haven't skipped a single day of practice, which considering that my health is pretty poor, there have been days of two minutes of meditation or three minutes of meditation. And there have been days or weeks when I felt like yeah, my meditation is so bad. I'm so tired. This is not going anywhere. Why am I even doing this? Mm. But I, I guess it's also like once you have done it for a year in a row, then you're like, I'm not going to skip a day because that would be silly. Mm. Uh, it's really interesting that you started with loving kindness practice because um, at this point when I teach people, if I, if I had a hypothetical person that was just totally brand new to meditation, I would really start them off with loving kindness because I, I think it's such a great start. And then usually in my experience, like I, I started with following the breath and doing body scans and at least most of the people that I've met and talked to seem to have started with similar things. But I think loving kindness is uh, just a really wonderful place to start. Um, it's neat that that's happened to be how you started. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend that as well to a beginner or someone starting out? I guess so, though. I have met people who think that loving kindness is a very advanced practice. Mm. I, I was actually surprised that some people I've talked to on Twitter have considered that, like, that, no, I am, I meditated for years before I was able to do it. And that, that was actually surprising for me because... I never found it really hard. Right, right. Yeah, I know a lot of people can have a hard time sending love to themselves or if they have 
history with like difficult people that can always be really hard. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's been mostly smooth sailing. Uh, granted, I had a lot of, a lot of practice under my belt before I started. So I'm not really sure if it was easy for me because of my practice history or not, but, um, how would you, how would you describe to someone that hasn't done loving kindness practice or metta, like what the practice is and what it, what it's like in your own experience? Yeah, the, the way most loving kindness meditations, uh, they focus on sending wishes for well-being uh, in form of verbal sentences, but you don't say them out loud, you just think them. And the point is to really like, they are not mantras, you are really trying to feel these wishes. And they usually they are in the form of may you may you be happy, may you be loved, may I be happy, may I be loved. And there are there are other ways of uh, sending loving kindness, such as just feeling it without these sentences or just radiating it to all directions or a certain direction. But yeah, I, I don't really use the sentences much anymore, though recently I have, I have kind of like uh, experimented with different kinds of sentences. And when you use sentences, it can give you insight. Like if, if I say, may I be happy? and then it feels awkward, then it's possible that I don't want myself really to be happy. Or if I wish myself good health, I might feel like, I may feel that I'm never going to have good health. So what's the point in even wishing for that? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So sort of like complicated feelings or beliefs can come up when you're doing loving kindness practice. Yeah, I, I've definitely like when I started, it was so easy, but I've definitely had some like hung ups over the years, like at the end of last year, I was having a really hard time. Like I felt that I didn't feel close enough to anyone else. So I could, I could send meta to myself, but it was hard to send it to other people. Mm. And then there was like trauma related hang ups. And, and for a while, it just felt really hard. If it does get hard like that, like, how have you worked with that yourself? And how would you recommend someone else work with those kinds of challenges with loving kindness? Yeah, I, I guess it really depends on like, what the exact challenge is. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if the problem is that you don't feel close to anyone, well, of course, you can send loving kindness to anyone. You can send it to your enemies or people you don't know. But it <laughs> tends to be easier to send it to people you really feel very warmly about. And, but I guess for most people, the problem is, is that they really struggle sending it to themselves and not to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Now, you said you mostly don't use the phrases now, although you still experiment with it from time to time. Um, what is your experience of doing it like now? I mean, I, I can imagine, but just would be curious to hear you describe that. Uh, yeah, usually I, I practice a form of uh, metta, which is called tranquil wisdom inside meditation, which mm -hmm. doesn't sound like a form of loving kindness meditation, but it is. And uh, while in normal or usual loving kindness meditation, you send loving kindness to yourself, to someone who is close to you, uh, someone who is neutral, like a bus driver you see every week, but don't know, and enemies or people you don't like. But uh, in Tranquil Wisdom Inside Meditation, you only send metta to yourself and a close spiritual friend. Mm. But I do admit I sometimes stray from this, like I, I sometimes uh, send metta to people, for example, who have hurt me to really like see if, if I can send them loving kindness and 
or are they really like do I feel it's as easy to send to them as to my best friend right right oh why does that form of meta have you restricted to yourself and just a close spiritual friend uh the point is to really like to really make you feel as feel it as strongly as possible and to not kind of distract you like like the point is not really for personal development but to really like make it effective as meditation and it also like you when when you use a spiritual friend it's supposed to be the same person forever but i do admit I have changed it a few times because sometimes you have a falling out with someone and then it may not feel like this is the closest person I have. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I don't really normally use the sentences. I just try to really feel the warmth. I normally start with that spiritual friend because, well, it's easier to really feel warmth and to really wish for the happiness of someone who is very dear to me and then i also send metta to myself but I, I sometimes do it differently like sometimes i imagine all the parts of my mind like i send metta to all my parts or i imagine all my friends parts all, or, or all my parts, sending loving kindness to my friend's parts, or even all parts of all beings. And I think that uh, adds an interesting dimension to it. Gotcha. Uh, interesting, interesting. So, yeah, I think that you're, at least in my experience, both this like playfulness that you're talking about of like adapting to what works and sort of avoiding what's hard and leaning towards what's easier. And then also just, yeah, trying new things and um, seems to be really helpful for this practice. So it's interesting to hear about the kinds of adjustments that you've made. And um, yeah, can you t tell me more about this form of um, tranquil, wins tranquil wisdom insight meditation and what's, what's that all about? And why does it use metta and things like that? Uh, it's a form of meditation developed by Bande Vimala Ramsey, and he says that it's really like it's the most old school Buddhist meditation there is, that he has based all of the technique on the suttas. So it's like this is what the Buddha really said, mm -hmm. and everything else is less that less what the Buddha said. And yeah, I'm, I'm not a scholar and I, I don't think there's a lot of point to argue like against other types of meditation because clearly they also work. And yeah, I, I'm not competent enough to say what the Buddha really <laughs> said <laughs> to me. It, it's not really the point for me. The point is that it works, but it also uh, another important point is the relaxed step. So basically, most meditation techniques have a like instruction. What do you do when you notice you have become distracted? So it might be that you just ignore the distraction, which I think is probably the most common approach. But uh, this meditation has this uh process called the six r's and now i'm not sure if i actually <laughs> remember because it's uh it's recognize the distraction uh release tension relax re-smile because you're you're supposed to be smiling when you send loving kindness so if you notice you're no longer smiling you re-smile and then you uh, can't remember what the last two, one of the last two R's is repeat. Hmm. And I think the other one is probably remember to do this. 
but yeah it's it's considered like the most important part of this type of meditation that the idea is not that you never become distracted but you observe your mind that even though metta is normally considered a form of concentration meditation now here it's considered inside meditation and an important part of the insights is watching how your mind works. Interesting. Um, so what are, what are the kind of um, effects or results that you've seen from using love and kindness as, approach, as an approach to insight practices? Well, I, I feel like I'm doing love and kindness and insight practice uh -huh. in one. Yeah. But it's, it's really like, I feel loving kindness is the most pleasant form of meditation. Mm -hmm. So that's, of course, it makes it fun. And you don't need external motivation. Like most people do have to kind of like, OK, I'm going to meditate now or I'm going to meditate now because I didn't yet meditate today. For me, the actual enjoyment of the meditation is the motivation. And uh, it also it tends to leave me feeling happy. And in general, in general, it increases your happiness. People often feel that it really like improves their relationships. And especially like you may feel that the relationship with the person that you're sending loving kindness to improves. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I, I love that you're able to connect to the practice as just delightful because it's something that you want to do that you don't need motivation for because um, just in my own experience that took a long time to get to and uh, it's, I'm really happy that that's happened for me now. And Metta was a big part of that. And I'm happy for you that, that you're there. You're just like, I want to meditate. It feels great. Here we go. Um, yeah, but can you say more though about, um, yeah, I imagine some people might not know what insight practice is or what the fruits of that are. And, and I'd be curious to hear in particular as well, like what your own experience of that is and what kind of shifts happen with, through doing insight practice and um, the benefits that you mentioned all, all make sense to me as something that would come from loving kindness practice, but I'm curious to hear about the insight dimension of it as well. Yeah, I, I have also done uh, a few days later after I started doing loving kindness practice, I Googled Vipassana because my friend, I knew my friend had practiced it years ago. And I had no idea what it was. I only found out much later that it's actually basically the same thing as mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. But I had this idea that mindfulness is something cheesy, you know, like <laughs> sunset pictures with a cliche text on them <laughs> people on Facebook. So I'm pretty happy that I didn't know that mindfulness is the same thing. But yeah, I, I, I also practiced Vipassana, especially body scans. And I do feel like it gave me some insights very early on. Like the very first time I was practicing body scans, I got this voice telling me like, you're imperfect. But it didn't feel like a judging voice. It felt like it's really hard to describe. It was like this friendly voice. Hmm. And uh, it's really like, of course, it, it feels completely silly to say like, I meditated for the first time and I got this insight. That's not how it's supposed to work. Hmm. But uh, and of course, it's it's not really like it, it was just the beginning of the journey. But uh, for some time, I continued doing both body scans and meta. But I think it was largely because people were always like, meta is a side meditation. You do the proper meditation, mm. and then you do some meta. And it never really felt right to me. But I was like, 
everyone's saying this, so I guess it might be true. <laughs> but <laughs> then I, then when I found out about tranquil wisdom inside meditation, and I was like, yeah, I could actually just do this, and uh, yeah, I, I have found it very helpful for inside practice as well. Gotcha, gotcha. And also the point of tranquil wisdom inside meditation is that you use metta to access jhanas, which are states of meditation. And they are often called states of concentration. And I think they can be, but it's a bit misleading. Uh, in metta, jhanas can be more like feedback loops and you use, for example, the first jhana is all about joy. So when you're doing metta, you're already feeling joy, as opposed to <laughs> when you're following your breath. I, it's just not the same thing. So with metta, it's much easier to access the jhanas. And uh, it's, the point is to access the jhanas and then you do insight practice while you are in the jhanas. So this is a bit different from the, the traditional idea of the jhanas is that you develop a very deep concentration, then you enter the jhanas. Uh, after you have spent some time in them, you exit the jhanas and then you do insight practice. And traditionally, the point has been to really like, you have to get a very deep concentration so that your jhanas will be very deep and then you can really improve your insight practice. But the point in tranquil wisdom inside meditation is that the jhanas are not supposed to be very deep. They are actually supposed to be light so that you can do the practice you can do inside practice while in them and not after them. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, say, hmm, say, say someone's curious about these jhanas that you're talking about. Like, well, first off, uh, why, why would someone be interested in them? Like, what, what would be a reason to explore this stuff? And then say someone is interested in exploring them, how would you recommend that someone start to uh, do jhana practice and access these states? Yeah, I, I guess it's really like jhanas are a bit contested. Mm -hmm. Like uh, some schools of Buddhism think that they are essential for enlightenment. Some schools think that they are useful for enlightenment, but not necessary. They will help you, but you don't need them. And there are schools that think that you shouldn't do them at all. So obviously I'm of the school that you, they, they may not be strictly necessary, but they sure help a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, as to how to get to them, well, my recommendation would be to do meta practice and do it the way where you really like, you don't switch around, but you keep sending, for example, sending loving kindness to your best friend, for example, for 30 minutes instead of switching to a different person. So it, it, if you're really able to feel like very deep wishes that I really wish for the happiness of this person, I wish it deeper than anything in this world, then it should be very easy for you to access the jhanas which is contrary to the traditional view, which is that you may have to meditate for five years to get enough concentration to enter the jhanas. For me, it took like a month of practice and supposedly some people can do it much quicker. Gotcha. Huh. So, so say that you're um, this hypothetical person, they're interested in the jhanas, they do metta practice, they, they stay with sending metta, loving kindness to a friend, and they're there for, say, half an hour. What would you suggest that they do after that if, if they've got that firmly established? Like, how, how would they get into these states or, um, yeah? 
yeah, the thing with metta is that since you're already in a state of joy, you're absorbed in the joy. Jhanas are often called absorptions. So if you're doing metta, basically you don't really have to do anything else. If you just keep doing it, you should end up in a jhana, which feel it's, it's possible to do it and not be aware of it because you're just moving from joy and bliss to a slightly different type of joy, which is like more, um, it's, it's kind of like, it really fills your world. That's, that's not the right way to put it, but it's, it's getting close to it. But it's really, when you're meditating on your breath, then but usually people have to kind of switch their technique to enter the jhana. But with metta, you, you don't really have to change your technique. Right. Um, I'm reminded that I've seen some people make a distinction between um, jhanas in general and then metta jhanas in particular. Have you experienced a difference in the kind of flavor of jhana practice from entering it through metta or, or say following the breath or a different technique or is it all jhana for you or how do you experience that? I have actually, well, I, I used to be able to enter jhanas very spontaneously without meditation and I, I still sometimes can do it. And I've only done it once while following the breath because it's just, I don't normally uh, do that type of meditation at all. Uh, but it's really, I guess there are so many classifications for jhanas and uh, it's really like some people think that deep jhanas or light jhanas, they are like fundamentally different. I think it's more of a really a spectrum. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. But it's really, I, I'm not sure if, if they are different, but Probably not. It's really usually the biggest difference is how deep you are in the jhana, which, for example, are you able to, for example, sense your body? If you're in a deep jhana, you may not sense your body at all, or it's it may be actually like you may not be able to get distracted because you're so absorbed in it. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wanting to like reveal a little bit of where I'm coming from for anyone that might be watching because like for me, I have almost this like almost e like evangelical fervor about meditation and uh, in particular metta meditation and jhana practice because um, I don't know, with, with, for one thing, different people talk about jhanas differently and there can be a kind of like oh, there's this super deep thing that you haven't gotten to yet. And that makes sense because there is a spectrum and there's definitely different depths. And I'm sure that deeper is better. And these states are, in my experience, in my experience surprisingly accessible, not that hard to get into. And, and Metta in particular is a really relatively easy way to get into it. And then it's like, wow, there's this joy and pleasure that's available relatively easily that you can access any time and just start feeling really good in your body without, you know, money or any particular situation or um, anything like that. Um, yeah, so th that's part of like why I'm wanting to ask you about this and uh, share it with the world is because I think that these things are worth making available to people like that loving kindness is enjoyable in itself and it also leads to these wonderful states. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's kind of funny that often jhanas are treated as this like almost superhuman stage. Like you have to, you may have to go to a retreat, otherwise your concentration may not be enough, or you may have to meditate for several years, while at the same time, uh, even the Buddha was said to have access jhanas as a kid, and of course he is supposed to have had some superhuman powers, but there are other people who have also accidentally entered jhanas as a kid 
which doesn't make sense from the common view that you have to have extreme levels of concentration. How would that small kid have that? But what the kids have is the ability to enter the feedback loop. They're able to feel so much joy that they can enter the jhanas. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, at least for me, um, I'm sort of mentally bookmarking that I think that there are probably deeper states than the ones that I've gotten into um, and that those would be worth exploring if they become available. And at the same time, these these ones that are that I have found that are, you know, really enjoyable and pretty easy to get into are just delightful in and of themselves and feel grateful for those. And um, and also, yeah, that since they're almost not that hard to get into, it's like wanting to make that available to other people because it's it's pretty easy actually and uh, or, and so beneficial, yeah. Um, and it's also funny that most people have never heard of them. Like most people, if they think of altered states that exist and they are jhanas, they are eight of them. So technically it's not one altered state, it's eight different ones that most people have never heard of. Totally, totally. I know, I know for me, like there can be a thing where, I don't know, maybe this is from being American or something, but uh, if there's like a word in another language, it can be kind of intimidating. You're like, oh, I'm not sure what they're referring to. And that's probably really hard and scary and difficult to get into and refined and esoteric and all this stuff. And then it's just been surprising that at least these lighter jhanas are just very available and not not that hard to get into. Um, yeah, can you tell me a little bit more um, and, and just for the audience as well about, you mentioned that there is eight different jhanas and the first one is characterized by this joy, which you can get into through loving kindness because there is a lot of joy and happiness there. How, do, how does this sort of spectrum of jhanas unfold in your experience? How would you talk about that? Yeah, so there are eight jhanas and they are usually accessed in sequence. So it's, it's possible to like skip them or move out of order, but usually you first learn the first one and then after you have some experience, you can then learn the second one. But yeah, the four, first four ones are more about emotion, especially the first two. The one, the first one is really about joy and bliss, and it can feel very like people really wouldn't believe it can be so blissful that it's it's better than you can really access with anything. And I do believe it's probably better than any drug that exists, but I wouldn't know about that. The second one is still, it's like happiness, but it's not as really as overwhelming or it's its a bit calmer. Then the third and fourth one have a much more like, they're still very pleasant, but in a much more neutral way. Right, so there's kind of a progressive refinement of emotions from like sort of this bliss to more and more quiet contentment kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and it's it's really like even though the first one is so pleasurable, the ones after it are also very enjoyable, just in a different way. Then the jhanas five, six, seven, and eight, which some people consider variations of the fourth one, they are called formless jhanas, and they are not really about emotion. They are really more about space and the nature of consciousness and they can be quite hard to explain i think hmm. Hmm. Uh, how did you start to make that jump from the fourth one to the the later formless ones uh i i could get to the fourth one like pretty easily within a few months and then I, then I was able to access the fifth jhana very rarely, like maybe once a month, but it's really the fifth to sixth that for some reason was the hardest. It took me like 
I think there was six months or something from the time that when I accessed the fir uh, fifth jhana for the first time to accessing the sixth one for the first time. But I don't think that's usual. It's the sixth one is not supposed to be very hard. Yeah, I imagine but, that it's pretty different for different people what's easy and hard. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, like, life happened a lot, like my meditation practice, there was a lot of stuff happening in my life. And it, it really, at times, it felt that I was really like, hitting a wall, and I wasn't making any progress. But then suddenly, there was progress again, which I guess is the nature of growth or whatever. Right, right. That all makes sense. So you mentioned that with this form of meditation that you do the insight practices within the jhana. Um, say someone is, you know, encountering these states and is curious about insight practice, like what exactly are you doing when you enter the jhana to do the insight practices within it? Um, I, I find it a bit hard to describe, but the Tranquil Wisdom Inside Meditation basically has like instructions for every jhana. Like when you're in this jhana and at this state of your practice, you do this. And basically I haven't really, I haven't really followed those instructions very much. Mm -hmm. I just really like observe the nature of my state, the nature of my mind and how the metta is feeling and that's that's how i do inside practice a lot of people are really like they are ex more explicitly focusing on like i'm focusing on impermanence i'm focusing on suffering i'm focusing on non-self and i don't really do that but it's really it feels like they still reveal themselves to me so often people will focus on the three characteristics and their specific instructions for looking at those. Um, but in your experience, you're kind of just exploring and playing and looking at what the state of your mind is. And then from doing that, the three characteristics will arise and be more apparent. Is that is that fair to say? Yes. And I do think that they are really like big differences in like how different people's minds are suited to different practices or like some people may have to more explicitly like really focus for example on impermanence to get inside on impermanence but for others it might be like that you have an intention in your mind and that's enough and for some people jhanas are probably much easier than for others but i, I would assume that most people can enter them right Right. Uh, interesting. So yeah, tell me about um, your experience with internal family systems and IFS and parts work and um, both how you encountered that and, and what you do with it. And then also I'm curious to hear how that fits into and relates to kind of more traditional contemplative practices in your experience. Yeah, so basically I have experimented with a lot of different techniques, not just techniques of meditation, but also things that are often called self therapy techniques. Uh, one of the best known is focusing and internal family systems is another popular one. It's based on the idea that the mind is built out of parts, not really built, it's the parts emerge through your life. And uh, it's, it's an interesting approach, especially if you, well, people f feel that it fits very well with the Buddhist lens of looking at the mind, even, even if it's not really like explicit, like Buddhism doesn't say that the mind is made out of parts, but it really fits in very well. And uh, I learned of IFS about a year after I had started meditation. So I have done it for about two and a half years now. Gotcha. And what has your experience been as you've kind of uh, learned about it and practiced it for a couple of years? 
just finding out about it was quite a revelation for for me though it was like i i was one of the people who had never thought of their minds as parts it it seems like there are different kinds of people like some people naturally think of themselves themselves as parts then there are people who really don't but still pick up ifs pretty easily and then there are people who really struggle like they can't find their parts but for me it was really very easy to find my parts and it was the idea that i could isolate parts of my mind and i could have conversations with them it was fascinating and of course the idea that if i'm made out of parts everyone else is too so the world is not really made out of people the world is a society of parts so it has really changed my worldview a lot hmm. what's shifted as you've started to notice that other people are made out of different parts of themselves like how, how, what has that shift been like for you I, I feel it's been very helpful, especially because I've had some very difficult relationships in my life. For example, the person who introduced me to IFS was also abusive at times. So the traditional view of abusive people is that if someone is abusive, they are bad, they are evil. And so they are like good people and bad people. And that's not really a very fruitful way of looking at things because obviously if if you are close to someone who also behaves in a bad way you also probably know that most of the time this person behaves differently so they may behave they may be kind they may be nice they may be very helpful and loving so just lumping them as this person is evil it doesn't make any sense or everyone does bad stuff from time to time so if i treat someone badly am i evil that no no, no one feels they are evil mm -hmm. no one thinks that i'm the bad guy no gotcha uh, that's fascinating and how is your you know you, you mentioned that previously you were seeing yourself as kind of one person and then it was a big shift to see yourself as having a lot of different parts and how has that sort of affected your like emotional ability to do kind of self-therapy and this kind of thing how has your emotional life shifted as a result of uh, practicing ifs it has definitely been very very helpful and uh, i've had a lot of trauma so it has been helpful for the trauma, but also IFS is helpful for stuff that's sometimes called small t trauma or micro trauma. Mm. Like for example, uh, if, if people call you fat, you may not really, you may not develop PTSD, but you may start like second guessing yourself. Like, am I fat? Can I wear this dress? Can I go to the beach if I'm fat? Mm. So that's really something all of us have. We have patterns of thought, we have patterns of behavior that's really like, they are not really trauma, but they are usually caused because someone treated us in a certain way, often several times. So it has really, I feel like using IFS has changed me in really a lot of ways. But it, of, of course, it has also changed my relationships in different ways as changing myself, viewing the other person in a different way. And with people who are into IFS, I can actually talk to them in IFS. I can say, I think what I just said may have activated your fight part. And then it's nice if the person is able to if they are able to hear what i'm saying because a lot of people they can hear criticism as you are bad and no one wants to hear i'm bad 
but if you hear that my part woke up a part in you that's causing difficulty that's very different hmm interesting interesting so it's it's shifted how you see other people but also the way you interact with them and then also helped you to deal with uh like sort of big t traumas and small t traumas just the everyday challenges of life um have you noticed any particular effects that it's had on your meditation practice um yeah it's definitely like sometimes like i already explained that sometimes when i do meta it's kind of like it's kind of like meta mixed with ifs and also i feel like ifs in itself while some people feel it's more about the conversations you have with the parts and you may ask the parts like maybe you shouldn't act in this extreme way but in a more like moderate way but for me the most benefits of ifs haven't really been from talking to my parts but just being with my parts sending loving kindness to my parts so sometimes it's not really clear what i'm doing meditation or ifs the, the line between them sort of blurs and you're kind of using different things yeah. just to what makes sense um yeah yeah i've definitely experienced that as well and part of why i'm curious to ask about it and um you mentioned as well that you've tried like a lot of different techniques and a lot of different self-therapy type approaches and um can you mention any others that you've tried that are worth uh, worth it, like just sharing or talking about? Well, for me, it's really like IFS has been much more, uh, much more life changing, or I, I'm not sure if I would call any of the others life changing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. focusing is like the classical one, which is also quite similar to meditation, mm -hmm. where you're really I feel like focusing is kind of a base technique. You learn to you learn to listen to your body. For example, if you think that you are angry, but you are actually scared, and you're, you're, if you listen to your body, you will find out this. So if, if you learn focusing, you can also use IFS better because you can really listen to the messages your mind and your body are sending. Then there are many techniques that are like a bit related to focusing and IFS. Like there is something called core transformation. And before I learned of IFS, I used it quite a few times. And it's it's interesting because the like when you use the technique, it's it's kind of like a chain. And when the chain, the mental chain ends. It's, it's like this, you ask yourself questions and then you ask more questions. And then when you kind of end up to the core, it's called core state. And it feels quite similar to jhanas, but for some people it can last for several days. So for me, it's interesting, like what's the relationship to jhanas? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, right. That is really interesting. I mean, that's a question that I've had as well with IFS of they talk about self energy and, um, you know, different people talk about that differently. But for me, that certainly seems to be related to jhana practice. And uh, there's some overlap there as well. Um, yeah, and I guess one, you know, I've been diving into all of these different techniques as well. And um, one thing that I'm always curious about is you know, when there are so many different techniques and modalities and approaches, how you decide which one to use when. And it seems like there's a bit of just um, exploring and by exploring, you discern, oh, in this situation, this is good. This kind of thing works for me. But I'd be curious to hear you talk about, you know, how you decide which technique to do or what approach to take with different kinds of situations or challenges. Yeah, I actually, sorry. To go a bit back first, you, you mentioned uh, the connection between IFS mm -hmm. and jhanas. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I started to practice non-dual meditation a year ago. And that's also very interesting mm. 
the connection between non-dual states and the self, as it's known in IFS. And uh, I, I read the book from Locke Kelly, which is uh, the way of effortless mindfulness, which also discusses IFS. And it kind of posits that non-dual states and the IFS self are the same thing. And, and they certainly feel very similar in some ways, but it feels like the non-dual states are more state-like. And the, but if you do non-dual meditation, I, I, I find, at least for me, it also makes the IFS self more state-like, which makes it easier to stay in self because it's it's kind of like a distinct state. So exploring non-dual states has helped you uh, in your IFS practice because it makes it easier to stay in self. I, I think it's really, it works both ways. Uh -huh. Basically all these techniques help other techniques, but it's, I think IFS and non-dual meditation and IFS and Metta are really like the closest pairings where there's really like a lot of interaction and often even unclear where one technique begins and the other ends. Hmm. I, I think that's actually, uh, I'm glad you went back to that. And that also <laughs> does seem to be like a really good answer to my question of like, you don't necessarily need, oh, do this in this situation and this in that situation. You just kind of play around and then they all support each other and you kind of learn over time what, what works and how they help each other. And uh, it just kind of unfolds. Yeah, and it's for, for me, it's been, I'm the kind of a person who's a bit of like a completionist. I love learning everything. And of course, with meditation, it's not possible with most things in the world. It's not possible to learn everything. But I have read a lot of books on meditation. I have read a lot of books on trauma, on self-therapy. And it's really like many people are like, isn't it like too much if you know like 10 different techniques and no it, it doesn't feel like too much it feels like it feels great that i'm able to really combine different things and one thing that i think i didn't mention yet is alexander technique which is often called body work but it's really many people think that it's really more like mind work or it's it's basically a type of meditation so and it's it's also it's not really like one technique it's a combination of techniques that are like spatial awareness body awareness and really they really interact in interesting ways with like all of this interacts together and I think it's just like knowing all these techniques is just a really fun world to play with and play in. Like when I was uh, uh, waiting for you to join the, this call, I was feeling a bit nervous and I combined Meta and IFS and Alexander technique. And it's just like, I just use whatever tools I know and which are the best in current situation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I love hearing you talk about that. Um, it's just a really delightful place to be and um, to be playing with all of these things, as you say. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to like recommend or mention to someone that's watching this? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, I, I do recommend looking into Alexander technique. It's uh, traditionally, it's really something that you go to an Alexander teacher and they adjust your body. For example, if you, if you walk, you probably walk in a way that feels natural and right to you, but you may, it may not even be symmetrical. So the teacher, it, it's not like manipulation. The teacher just very gently adjusts you. But if you do Alexander technique on your own, you're able to focus more on the awareness aspects. So that's that's something I really recommend. 
So if it is something that traditionally you've gone to, you would go to a teacher for like, how, how would you, would you recommend that? Or if someone wants to explore it on their own, what would you recommend for that? I guess it's really what you're looking for because I also, I also have chronic illnesses. So for me, the way it's, it's all kind of like Alexander technique is also used for chronic pain, for example. But I haven't been able to visit an Alexander Technique uh, practitioner. I do hope to, to do it in the future. But I guess it's really like, it's probably better if you can wi visit a practitioner. But it's like, if you can't, don't let it stop you because it's really like the practitioners are mostly there to adjust your body. And if you want to, for example, focus on the spatial awareness, you can do it on your own. Is there a book that you'd recommend or something like that? Uh, yeah, I've, I've read two books. And uh, the one I prefer is, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name because it's like how you move how you, yeah, I can't remember the name now, but I'm sure you can add it as a link. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But it's really like, and I, I'm also been working on, like, I'm hoping to record a meditation that's been inspired by Alexander Technique, but it's really like, my, my own practice recently has been so weird and kind of, so life-changing that my hobby of recording meditation and hypnosis audios has been pushed to the side. Interesting. Huh. Well, what are you exploring in your meditation practice these days? Yeah, so basically two months ago, I reached a very major milestone in meditation. Uh, which I would call the second path in Buddhism. So, and that's followed by a, a stage called review, which is, has been a very <laughs> interesting place to be in. Because there's, yeah, now I'm introducing a lot of concepts that mm -hmm. are hard to describe or explain in a short amount of time but basically in meditation there are inside stages to go through and in review the inside stages repeat very quickly over and over again and i have no idea why that actually happens on a biological level i have no clue but it's it's kind of it's a fascinating state to be in but it really, it, it feels very overwhelming at times because it feels I'm constantly processing something and I can't take a break. My mind is just doing it and I, I can't do anything about it. And most of it has been absolutely fantastic, like the best time in my whole life. But there has also been quite a few dark night episodes where it's like, oh, I got this insight that was lovely at first, but now I actually hate it. And it's making me feel like I don't even exist. <laughs> mm. Wow, that sounds really intense. <laughs> yeah, uh, interesting. Well, I'll definitely pop a link to the book that you're mentioning in the uh, show notes, as well as some other things that you've mentioned. and. Um, maybe your YouTube channel as well with the recordings that you have. Uh, I'm sure people will want to check those out. But um, thank you so much for joining me today. And it's been really delightful to talk to you, Maya. Yeah, thank you for inviting me.